True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Robert and Benjamin Moore were best friends and brothers who spent most of their time together. They were smart and good-looking and both were naturally funny. In fact, it was rare to see either of them without a smile on his face. And like most boys their age, they liked to tease their little sister, play video games, and ride their bikes. When Robert and Ben disappeared on the morning of August 30th, 1993, their mother, Roberta, had left the house to care for her elderly father who lived nearby. The boy's father, John Moore, was home with their three children. When John called Roberta to tell her that the two boys were missing, she rushed home. From that day forward, her life was a daily struggle with a deep visceral pain of loss and confusion. Join us at the quiet end for Close to Home, the disappearance of Robert and Benjamin Moore. John Moore's behavior that day and his recollections of what happened should have been a cause for concern and suspicion by investigators, but they somehow accepted implausible conclusions. Today we'll analyze the religious obsessions and small-town politics that led to a botched investigation. In doing so, we'll search for reasons why two innocent brothers were taken from their mother and their young, promising lives were ended so close to home. So I have a really nice Wisconsin beer I've been waiting to put into an episode. This one's called Brewer's Reserve Bourbon Barrel Stout from a really great brewery in Wisconsin's Central Waters Brewing Company. This is an American Imperial Stout. It's 10.8% alcohol by volume. Beer is a dark brown color with a small tan head. Nice aroma, some bourbon and roasted malt. And the taste is coffee, vanilla, and bourbon. My kind of beer. It does sound like your kind of beer. It's nice and medium bodied, so uh, let's let's open it and have a drink or two. That sounds like a plan. All right, Dickie, down to the quiet end. Lots to talk about today, right? Have you ever heard of such a case before? This is an amazing case. I've looked at it a few times. I just can't believe it ended up the way it's ended up. I know. And usually I have a feeling about a case and I think I know what happened, but I'm very perplexed. Yeah, And very too. confused. Yeah. So why don't you start us off? Okay, away we go. The small town of Ogma, Wisconsin, was cooler than usual on August 30, 1993, almost as if autumn had come early. Roberta Moore, mother of three, woke up around 6.45 in the morning to the sound of her alarm clock. She hated to leave her warm bed, but she knew she had a busy day ahead, and her husband John was already up. Roberta and John had three kids. Robert, the oldest, was 13. His brother Ben was 10, and the youngest was Lisa at age 5. Like most kids, the Moore brothers didn't like to get up early for school. Their normal routine was to hurry to get dressed so they could get a quick game of Nintendo in, and then they'd run out to catch the bus. So Roberta got a cup of coffee from the kitchen before she rushed out to get dressed. She spoke to her sister on the phone until about ten past seven, and then it was time for her to leave for her job as the caretaker of her elderly father. Little Lisa is going to her fourth day of kindergarten. and Before she left, Roberta reminded John to pin Lisa's name tag onto her dress before she left for school. It was raining out, So Roberta took an umbrella and walked out to her blue pickup truck. Well, Roberta arrived at her father's house at 7.45, she said, and she was only there for 15 to 20 minutes when the phone rang. It was her husband, John, and he told her he couldn't find the boys anywhere. This didn't make any sense to Roberta, who knew that her boys always stayed close to home. Also, they had school that morning, so where could they have gone? Yeah, this timeline is is just... This woman leaves, and like within 15, 20 minutes, she gets a call. I yes. Mean, holy cow. How can they disappear that quickly? Or how come people aren't suspicious of 
why they left so quickly. Well, I guess they were suspicious. They were wondering where they went to. But I don't know why he would call her so quickly without going and looking first. Right. Yeah, well, the whole thing's weird, as you'll see. Yeah, I'm getting that impression. So the mornings were typically quiet for the Price County Sheriff's Department. Officer Ross Hansa could see the rain coming down as he drank his first cup of coffee that morning. When the 911 call came in, he was expecting the usual stuff, like a minor car accident or maybe a petty theft. It was 8.25 when he answered the call. Roberta Moore was on the line, her voice surprisingly calm as if she were in shock. And in a strange, matter-of-fact tone, Roberta explained that her two sons were supposed to go to school, but then her husband had found them in an old car on the Rails to Trails snowmobile trail. I believe they have shot themselves, she said. Officer Hansa was shocked and disturbed to hear this, and his heart broke for this woman on the other end of the line. He told her help was on the way. So Deputy Michael Roberts, a young man who'd been working for the Sheriff's Department for four years, was used to dealing with things like traffic problems and domestic disturbances. Serious crimes just weren't expected in the rural Price County area. As he was driving down the highway in his cruiser, he heard a message over his radio telling him to return to the station. As he drove back toward town, he heard a message to the ambulance service directing them to an emergency in the town of Ogba. Now back at the station, Deputy Roberts was met by Chief Deputy Tim Gould, who told him that they may have a double homicide to respond to. So Roberts and Gould got into Gould's cruiser and raced to the scene with their lights and siren on. They arrived at the intersection of Spring Road and Rails to Trails at 8.50 in the morning. Now the road was already crowded with people and the ambulance was parked on the side of Spring Road, but there were also several other vehicles. Roberts and Gould walked quickly toward the path. This was only used for recreation, like biking, ATVs, and snowmobiles, and surrounded by trees on both sides. On a normal workday morning, the path was desolate, totally bare, but this morning it was crowded with anxious people. Well, when the deputies had made it just over half a mile south, they saw another ambulance. Several men were walking around the ambulance and a small red Nissan pickup. The truck belonged to Ronald Zandenelsen. He was a burly guy with red hair and glasses who worked as a firefighter and a first responder. He was known for being one of the most experienced members of the Price County EMTs. In front of the Nissan, a 1980 Mazda station wagon was parked facing south. It was right in front of the Nissan's front bumper. The station wagon was old and rusted. It had been spray painted with graffiti and the rear hatch was open. When Deputy Roberts got closer to the station wagon, he saw two bodies lying on the ground behind it. These were children. Two male children were lying there face up. The smaller, younger one, Benjamin, had his head facing west. The larger, older boy, Robert, was facing east. Robert's feet and lower legs were at least 12 inches underneath the back end of the car, and Benjamin's feet were nearly touching Robert's feet. They were both barefoot. Their feet were dirty and scratched and covered with leaves. Their hands were scratched with leaves all over them as well. A long rifle was lying between Benjamin's legs, and one of the officers would just describe that as an obscene sight. Yeah, I can see that. Now, you you said that when the mother called the police or 911, that they had been in the car. That's what the mother said. Yeah, but they weren't. No, they were on the ground. The mother will say a lot of things that are incorrect. This is a very mixed up case. So Benjamin had some obvious trauma to the right side of his head. His mouth was open. There was a small amount of blood at the corner of his mouth. His eyes were closed, but his cheeks were still pink. His short sleeve pink t-shirt had blood on the front and the back. His jeans were dirty and sprayed with blood. It was such a horrible sight that the first responders and deputies had difficulty accepting what they were seeing. Now Officer Roberts, who had only been working as a deputy for four years, had an especially tough time with this scene. Thirteen-year-old Robert looked as if he had been dead for a longer time than his brother. He was white, and rigor mortis was setting in. The back of his left hand was lacerated and bleeding. His eyes and mouth were partially open. 
He was wearing an orange t-shirt, and this was soaked through with blood. His feet couldn't be seen because they were so far beneath the car. So Deputy Gould and Deputy Roberts cleared the area and had people move back to Spring Road. Then they spoke with first responder Van Den Elsen. Van Den Elsen explained that he had heard the emergency call on the radio in his truck, and he was only 10 minutes away from rails to trail, so he rushed to the scene. He said as he began to drive into the trail, he saw another first responder, Neil Holm, heading out there. So Neil jumped into Van Den Elsen's pickup, and they drove to the station wagon together. They parked behind the station wagon and called out to see if anyone would respond. They saw the gun lying there with the boys, so they approached carefully. Neither of them could believe what they saw. They looked at Benjamin first and saw the trauma to his head. They didn't touch him. When they looked at Robert, he was very pale. They checked for a carotid pulse on his neck, but couldn't feel one. Van Den Elsen got his stethoscope from his truck and listened for a pulse, but there was none. So the two men returned to their truck and waited. Well, the ambulance arrived minutes later and backed up to the scene. The EMT checked Benjamin for a pulse and found none. After briefing Deputy Roberts, the EMTs were sent away. Roberts led the rest of the bystanders away. He recognized all of them, except for one man who walked quietly with them. Roberts asked Neil if he knew this man. Now Neil was surprised. He thought the deputies knew who it was. It was John Moore, the boy's father. So this guy's been standing here the whole time and didn't say anything. Yes, yes. So, so Roberts is stunned. Yeah, wouldn't you be? <laughs> I'd be more than stunned. He told Gould that the boy's father had been there all along and hadn't said anything. So Gould instructed Roberts to question John Moore, find out if he knew what had happened. That's almost, to me, unbelievable. Well, just hold on to your seat, because there's more. Now, John Moore was a plain-looking guy of average height. His face was weathered, and he wore a permanent scowl on his face. He had thinning hair with a receding hairline. And when he spoke, he just seemed emotionless. Roberts approached John and introduced himself. He wasn't crying or obviously distressed as he gave the details of the morning to Deputy Roberts. So John said, my older boy is Robert and my youngest is Ben. Well, I got the boys up for school around 6.30 this morning. When I went to wake up my daughter, the boys disappeared. Then me and my wife went looking for them. My wife followed tire tracks from our driveway up to the trail. Then she came home to get me. We went back and I found the boys. So this story was strange. To say the least. Roberts didn't know what to do with it. He ended the preliminary interview as more curious people were trying to get close to the grim scene. He told John Moore to return home and wait until someone from the sheriff's department came there. So John agreed to do that and he left. Then it began to rain again, so Roberts got a blue plastic tarp from the ambulance to cover the boys' bodies and try and protect the evidence. Deputy Roberts photographed the scene, paying special attention to document the proximity of Van Den Elsen's truck to the boys' bodies. Deputy Gould notified the state crime lab. He hoped that they would be able to collect enough evidence to find the boys' murderer. He couldn't make sense of why anyone would kill these innocent children in this remote location near their home. Neighbors of the Moors lived only about a mile from the trail, and the father of the family had heard the vehicles and people flocking to the scene so he had decided to ride his three-wheel ATV out there and see what was going on. One of the EMS workers told him that there were two dead boys on the trail. This shocked him. He feared his own family was in danger if there was a killer on the loose. Van den Elsen couldn't wait any longer to speak with Roberts. He needed to share the many questions that were nagging him. So something's not right here, he told Roberts. Oh, see, that's bright. Yeah. I've never seen anything like this. Look how far the bigger kid's feet are under the car. How could that happen? Yeah, remember, we're going to be saying he killed himself, right? Yeah, that's what people are going how to say. How can he be half say. under the car? So when I first drove up, I thought this looked like some kind of drill. It reminded me of when I was in the military. Man, this must have been staged. So he was right on to it, I think. Yeah, well, so was Roberts. 
Yeah, because Robert's head thought the same thing, but he listened without putting his opinion in. Neil Holmes then spoke up and said, It doesn't make sense. It looks surreal. Now, I've worked murders, homicides, and suicides and never had this feeling before. I just can't understand what happened to these two kids. And he wiped tears from his eyes. He was so upset. Roberts asked both men to write out statements, and they did, including their initial suspicions about the scene. Both men wrote, it looked staged like a drill. So by the time they finished their report, Sheriff Wayne Worsing had arrived at Spring Road. He immediately took control of the scene, but he had no background or training in homicide investigation. He told Van Den Elsen to remove his truck and leave. So the EMT did as he was told, backing carefully away out of the trail. But he knew something was terribly wrong, and he just couldn't stop thinking what possible reason could someone have to execute these two young boys. Roberts went back to his squad car and called Patrick Schilling, the district attorney for Price County. From his home in Park Falls, the DA listened carefully as he was told about what had happened so far. Then after the call, Roberts returned to the crime scene. So Worsing told Roberts to wait for the forensics team. And in the meantime, County Coroner James Dalbicio arrived and he was briefed. The sheriff and the coroner discussed what the boy's mother, Roberta, had originally said on the 911 call. She must have known what she was talking about, and she had said it was a suicide. The rifle was with the bodies, so that did make some sense at the time. Now, crime scene technicians arrived around 11 in the morning. They began preparing and collecting evidence. Dalbicio didn't have what he needed to examine the bodies, so he returned home to pick up some equipment. The crime scene techs videotaped and photographed the scene. They examined and fingerprinted the antique 22 caliber H. Piper long single shot rifle. The same procedure was performed on a 22 long shell casing that was still jammed in the chamber. Then their attention turned to the old station wagon with the spray painted graffiti on the sides. The driver's side front fender was missing. The right headlight was also gone. The steering wheel was checked for prints, and it was then removed from the steering column to be logged into evidence. Technicians wondered how either of the two boys lying on the ground could have driven the old car, because the driver's seat was pushed way far back. The back seat was dirtier than the front, and an old tire lay in the back passenger side floorboard leaning up against the front seat. The floor and the seat were covered in wet leaves and empty soda cans. So this was just an old car that they kept around the house. Yeah, an old junker. The hatchback area had a jack and a tire iron, a pair of jeans, and a butter knife. A twenty-two long spent shell casing was lying in the cargo area. It looked as if it had been carefully placed there to Roberts, although he couldn't explain why it looked that way to him. Photographing the graffiti on the sides of the car, crime scene technicians were taken aback by what it said. The best car Ben will ever have was spray painted on the passenger side. On the left it read, Ben's bomb, and on the back, Ben's car. So the boys would drive that car just around their property when their father said they could. Yeah, now Robert's the older one, right? Yes. So why does it say Ben's car and not Robert's car? Because Ben's the one that wanted the car. I see. Now lifting the tarp from the boys' bodies, they were able to fingerprint them, and then their hands were swabbed for possible gunshot residue. The following items were received for fingerprint analysis as well. One Remington fired cartridge case, one 22 caliber H. Piper single shot rifle with no serial number, one Remington fired cartridge case from the chamber, and one steering wheel. The crime lab was able to lift a total of 17 latent fingerprints from the scene. As the crime scene techs were finishing up their work, Deputy Roberts noticed an unidentified male walking down the trail toward him, and he ran to stop the man while he was still a short distance from the scene. Are those my brothers down there? The young man asked in a shaking voice. Robert asked who he was. It's John Moore Jr. So is this a child from another marriage or something? Yes. Okay. He and Roberta both had older sons from previous marriages. 
So it would be best if you leave and go back to wait at your parents' house, Roberts told him. The man stood face to face with Roberts, arms crossed defiantly. Roberts warned him, you're only going to make matters worse if you don't leave now. Yes, yeah, so young John Moore, or Johnny as they called him, finally turned around and started back down the trail. But he wouldn't forget his run-in with the deputy. He'd hold a grudge that would kind of hold up some things in the upcoming investigation. The coroner inspected Robert and Ben Moore's bodies and officially pronounced them dead. Each boy had a nearly identical gunshot wound to the temporal region of his head. Robert's wound was on the left side, while Ben's was on the right. Again, Deputy Roberts looked up and he saw two men this time walking toward him on the trail. He ran to stop them. As he got closer, he recognized a guy in a suit as a local news personality, Christopher Miller from Channel 7. Sorry, but you and your cameramen can't come any closer, Officer Roberts told him. But then Miller asked to speak to Sheriff Worsing. Before Worsing had time to make a decision about how to handle these news people, he saw the two walking towards him. Sheriff Worsing ordered the deputy to move them back. So Robert stopped the men and told them they had to leave the area immediately, and they reluctantly left. Officer Roberts returned to his car out on Spring Road, opened the trunk, and removed a large roll of yellow crime scene tape. Then he put the yellow plastic tape across the entrance to the trail, try and prevent more people from wandering towards the crime scene. Yeah, I guess better late than never. Absolutely, yes. So by then it was close to one in the afternoon. Roberts drove back to meet with the district attorney. D.A. Schilling told him to interview the boy's parents and get as many details as possible about what had happened that morning. He wanted gunshot residue swabs from both parents and their clothing to take as evidence. So as Deputy Roberts was returning to the scene of the crime, he saw a long black station wagon leaving the trail. Chief Deputy Gould was in the front seat of the hearse and the driver was the local funeral home director. Robert and Benjamin Moore's bodies were in the back of the vehicle. Their destination was about 200 miles away, at the Ramsey County Medical Center, where they would undergo autopsies. Back on the trail, Sheriff Worsink directed Roberts to remain at the scene for at least two more hours. He wasn't released right away to interview Mr. and Mrs. Moore, as he'd been told to do by the DA. So Roberts was confused by the sheriff's orders. The bodies were already gone, after all, and he didn't understand why he should stay there. But against his own judgment, he followed his orders. He waited impatiently for the chance to speak with the parents. But he would soon find that confusion surrounded this case throughout the entire investigation. Yeah, maybe he should have said to the superior, his co-worker, that the district attorney told me to go talk to the parents. Maybe he should have, and maybe he did. Didn't matter. And maybe he was told no. Okay. We don't know, but this was his boss, yeah. not the DA. I know, but there's enough strange stuff going on that it'd be maybe a good idea to get to the parents quickly. Oh, absolutely, and I think Roberts realized that. I think he knew pretty early on that he was over his head here, that he wasn't really qualified. None of them were, but at least he seems like he tried to do his best. He did work the case pretty hard. Yeah, well, there's a state agency you can turn it over to, right? Yes, and I'm not sure why that didn't happen. Okay. So at around 4.45 p.m., Roberts returned a borrowed ATV to the Moore's neighbor's house. And he asked a group of locals there about the Moore family. Now, most of them didn't know the Moores very well. The family kept to themselves, and they were very quiet. They were members of the Jehovah's Witness Church. Now, after that short interview... Roberts was finally on his way to the Moore home. By this time, it's 5 p.m., so it had been a good eight hours since Roberts had spoken with John Moore. Yeah, the whole day had passed. He'd had plenty of time to do anything. Yeah. It was a short two-mile trip to the Moore's house on Prentice Road. A long gravel driveway led to the house, and there were thick woods behind the house. As he approached, Roberts saw the boys' bicycles lying near each other in the yard, and that made him feel pretty sad. The house was a red, two-story farmhouse trimmed with white, and there was a matching barn directly behind it. The large front porch had a swing, a rocking chair, and a chest-style freezer. Deputy Roberts had never had to speak with a parent whose children had been murdered before. He prepared himself for a hysterical mother and father. 
But John Moore was sitting calmly on the back porch steps, and Roberta wasn't even home. John invited the deputy into the house to talk. The inside of the house was neat and clean. Roberts was taken aback by John's composed manner, though. He wondered if maybe the man was in shock. When asked, John went over the morning. He said he got up at 6.30. He worked as a logger, but didn't plan to work that day because of the rain. He said that Roberta was up at 6.45, and she left just after 7 for her father's house. According to John, he heard the two boys moving around upstairs when he got up that morning. Ben was in the bathroom, and John waited for him to get out so he could use it. He said he saw Robert in the doorway between the living room and the kitchen, and said, here's Robert, but Robert didn't answer him. Then he went to get his daughter Lisa ready for school. At 7.30, he yelled for the boys, but they didn't respond. John said then he looked through the whole house but couldn't find them. He looked outside and inside the barn, but still no sign of them. Then John noticed that the old car the boys used to drive around the property was missing. He said that he didn't hear the car start up or drive away that morning. At 7.45, he called Roberta at her father's house to tell her that he couldn't find the boys. Uh, that just sounds so suspicious to me. I'm with you. That he, he didn't hear the boys doing anything. They just kind of disappeared. He never heard a car start up. And this is an old piece of crap car. Probably noisy. I don't like this story. No, I don't either. So John went on to say that Roberta arrived back home around 8 in the morning. She searched the house, and she drove her blue pickup around the trails looking for the old station wagon. She didn't find it, but she did see tire tracks leading to where it was found. The tracks turned onto Spring Road and turned onto the trail. But she didn't see the old car, so she turned around and got John. So it happened that John, Roberta, and Lisa, Lisa didn't leave the five-year-old home by herself, <laughs> so they were driving towards the trail. They parked on Spring Road, and Lisa and Roberta waited in the car while John walked down the trail alone. And after about half a mile, he saw the old car. Now, why would they stop? Right there. And then walk, right? Yeah. Why wouldn't she have driven down there when she was by herself either? Why, indeed. It certainly seems like one or both of them knew there was something they didn't want Lisa to see down there. Exactly. So as he got closer, John said, he saw his sons lying on the ground. He said he could see that Ben was shot in the head, but Robert didn't look hurt. He didn't touch his sons or anything else on the scene, he said. That's weird to me. He noticed that Ben was wearing his school clothes, but that Robert was wearing the same clothes he'd worn the day before. Now that's kind of important to remember that when you think of the timing of these deaths. So put a pin in that. I'll put a pin in that. He turned and began walking back until he met Roberta, and he said at this point Roberta was driving down the trail. John told Roberta, don't go any further, the boys are dead, just like that. They'd shot themselves and the gun was still with them, he told her. He said that he got into the driver's seat and drove the three of them back home, and then Roberta called 911. He didn't get that close. He could see his two sons that were deceased. Didn't feel for a pulse or shake them or look for a wound. Nothing. Nothing. And, and he goes back and says, by history to his wife, they shot themselves. Yep. And she calls 911 and says that. And she, yes. Very weird. So and when Robert showed John Moore a photo of the gun, he said, yeah, it looked like his gun. He hadn't used it for a couple of years, and he didn't even have any shells for it. So Roberts then asked John to show him the boy's room. Going into the room was painful. If not for John, then it was for Roberts. There were bunk beds with sheets decorated with footballs and the NFL logo and dogs. On a bureau, there was a Game Boy, a Superman comic book, and a radio. There were two posters on the walls, one of a motorcycle rider doing a big jump, and another of Indy 500 cars racing past a checkered flag. So typical country boy stuff. Yeah. The deputy searched through the drawers and closet, looking for a suicide note. He didn't find one. So it was the parents' room where the gun had been kept. The room was dark, with paneled walls, a double bed, and a dresser. John pointed out the top closet shelf and said that's where the gun was kept. Back downstairs, Roberts found the boys' backpacks and searched them. No note. 
They were full of the normal stuff like books, notebooks, and pens. Without being asked, John offered that Robert didn't like school and he was upset about going. He added that his gun was in such bad shape that after one shot is fired, the cartridge jams in the chamber and it has to be removed by hand with a tool. He said he didn't think the boys knew how to do that and he didn't even know if they had the strength to do that. Huh. Doesn't sound like a good double suicide method. No. Well, Roberts had been at the house for nearly an hour when Roberta finally got back home. She was with her little girl, Lisa, and a young adult male and female. This young man was Roberta's son from a previous marriage, and the young woman was his living girlfriend. The girlfriend took Lisa outside while Roberta spoke to Deputy Roberts. Now, Roberts was again very taken aback by Roberta's calm demeanor. She sat at the kitchen table and answered questions as Roberts took notes. She went over her morning with him, adding that she had seen Ben in the bathroom that morning, but she hadn't seen Robert. Her story from there matched John's version of events, almost word for word. And she spoke in a monotone. Not one tear was shed. Deputy Roberts asked Roberta to tell him about Ben and Robert. She had no difficulty speaking about them. It didn't seem at all choked up. She said that they got along well except for the normal fighting between siblings. She added, like John had, that Robert didn't want to go to school, and he'd asked several times to be homeschooled. But Roberta had not told Roberts the full story. She left out crucial information which could have helped with the investigation. Well, before he left, Deputy Roberts swabbed their hands for gunshot residue. But when he asked them for their clothing, they hesitated. Because Roberts had no way of knowing what Roberta or John had been wearing that morning, it really didn't matter. Both had all day long to change, bathe, or do laundry. So he didn't push it, he thanked them, offered his condolences, and left, feeling very uneasy about this whole thing. Deputy Roberts had a bad feeling as he drove back to the station from the Moore house. For one thing, he was realizing how over his head he was. He had no training in crime scene investigation, and he knew that experienced officers were needed. This case was not a clear murder-suicide by any stretch of the imagination. It was weird that neither Roberta nor John had driven down the trail to where the station wagon had been parked. And they were just so damn calm. Roberts had been on calls before where a parent had lost a child, and those parents were hysterical. They were in shock, and they just couldn't comprehend that their child was really gone forever. But the Moore's behavior was completely out of place in this situation. And his opinion was that this family was dysfunctional and they weren't telling him the whole story. John Moore was definitely an unusual man. He owned his own logging business where he employed several family members. His wife, Roberta, worked on his crew, as well as his oldest son, Johnny. Ben and Robert had also worked for John. When they were infants, Roberta had even brought them along in some pretty dangerous conditions. Yeah, John Moore had received warnings from the county about allowing Robert and Ben to work with chainsaws and other unsafe tools. John wasn't happy when he had to stop using them to do logging work. Well, of course not. Free labor. He didn't like that the boys weren't earning their keep. He believed that everyone in the family should pull their own weight. So what he did with this uh, situation was just wait a while, and then he's going to allow them to return to working the dangerous jobs. So he's just ignoring the county. Well, he thinks they're wrong, and he's right. One of Ben and Robert's favorite activities was to ride their bikes down to the 76 truck stop, where they could buy candy and rent video games. They always wanted to go faster, So the dream they shared was to someday have a motorcycle. And as they got older, and they complained about going to Kingdom Hall religious services with their father, John had told them that if they attended services once a week for two years, he would buy them a motorcycle. They did accept the bribe, they followed through, and John purchased a Yamaha for them, which they loved. So on the day after the boys' bodies were found, autopsies were performed by assistant medical examiner, Dr. Susan Rowe. She noted that Robert was a normally developed male in early adolescence. He is five foot three and weighed 130 pounds. 
His feet were soiled and scratched, and there was dirt beneath his toenails. His anus was slightly patulous, means it was kind of open, and that could be a sign of sexual abuse. Now, if that was the case, the abuse had not been recent. It would be back in time. Yeah, or maybe chronic because there were no external injuries. Right. So the parents in the sheriff's department had not explored this possibility in the past. So the chances of sexual abuse were kind of slim. Well, that's what Dr. Susan Rowe thought. I disagree. I would too. I think a chronic sexual abuse situation could explain a lot of things in this family. Yes. Robert's shirt was soaked with blood and the crotch seam of his jeans had a large tear. Robert had a temporary tattoo on his upper left arm, which was nearly worn off. It was the kid's kind that you might get in a cereal box. He had a scar on his forehead near the brow line. There was a blood spot on his right forearm, similar to a needle mark. The gunshot entry wound in his left temporal area had soot and powder deposits around its margins. The bullet had exited on the right side of his head above his ear. There were some abrasions and bruises that had no explanation. One was a large and purple one located on the left side of his forehead. This was consistent with a fall or a hard blow to the head, and it was surrounded with several small scratches and abrasions as well. There were also brown bruises over his right knee, his lower leg, and his foot, and his left lower leg had purple bruises, as well as his left elbow. None of this goes along with a suicide or murder-suicide. I was just going to ask you that. No, that's not suicide. No, and it gets weirder. Roberta would claim to know how her son got the bruises on his knees and lower legs. According to what she later told investigators, on the evening before his death, she saw her husband kicking Robert in the knees. Amazingly, she didn't know why, and she didn't ask her husband why. So what do you think of that? Well, I'm going back to chronic abuse. Yeah, yeah. Well, 10-year-old Ben's autopsy was performed next by the medical examiner, Dr. Michael McGee. The pink shirt he was wearing made Ben appear even younger. His short-sleeved t-shirt with rude dog over the left breast pocket was removed. It had blood soaked into the front and the back. His blue jeans had droplets of blood on the right thigh. The one thing that Dr. McGee didn't understand was why Ben's clothing was covered in dirt. The pants should have been clean if he had only worn them for less than two hours that morning. Yes, that's true. Both of these doctors didn't understand why neither boy had shoes or socks on on such a cool, wet morning. Both boys' feet and hands were scraped up, and there was dirt beneath their fingernails. So it looks like there was some kind of a struggle. Sounds like it. Ben's body was normally developed. He was 5 feet tall and weighed 99 pounds. Upon inspection, a traumatic injury to the right temporal region was identified as an entrance wound from the gunshot. On the left temporal area, an exit gunshot wound was noted, and bloody fluid was found in his mouth. Ben had some healed scars on his right calf and left thigh. He also had several injuries that couldn't be explained. Small contusions were seen on his lower extremities, especially his left thigh. Flecks of blood were on his right forearm and his wrist. His right upper arm had a large contusion, and his forearm had a very large cut. There were many wounds and discolorations on his left forearm and hand, at least 12 separate wounds in all. Wow. Certainly, these autopsies were not consistent with suicide. Ben was suspected by the police of watching his older brother shoot himself. Then, he supposedly pried the shell out of the old rifle, reloaded it, and shot himself. And no one could explain how Ben's short arms could have reached the trigger. That scenario, to me, is not credible at all. No, can't work that way. No. So medical examiners are physicians, while many county coroners are elected public officials with no medical training. We've talked about that a little bit before. All they need to qualify is to be over 18 and a U.S. citizen. County coroners are known for making mistakes, especially in small rural communities, like the one where Ben and Robert Moore had lived. Because it's difficult for many people to believe that a parent could be responsible for the death of their own child, many homicides have been listed as undetermined, natural causes, or suicide. The problem is worsened by parents who leave out information 
or lie to investigators. According to the U.S. Department of Justice statistics, family members are the most likely perpetrators in child homicides. And we've definitely discussed that before. Oh, we certainly have. Uh, And even most recently, talking about a mother who's murdered five of her children and claimed they were SIDS. Yes. Because you want to believe the mother. Of course. It just doesn't seem like someone could do that, even though the facts... That's Tell right. us that they do. It happens all the time, unfortunately. And the Ramsey County Medical Center had had a number of complaints about this situation over the years. For example, there's a 1998 case of 18-year-old Greg Meisner. He is found by his mother hanging in his closet. Even before the coroner came to the scene, the detectives had decided that Greg had committed suicide. But his parents knew this wasn't true. And for one thing... His hands were tied behind his back. So the Meisners did their own investigation and gathered enough evidence to convince the police that it was a homicide. And eventually the killer was found charged and convicted of Greg's murder. So this 18-year-old was about to be kind of swept under the rug as a suicide. And that's just one of the cases. There are dozens of cases in this area connected to that medical center and the coroner. Hmm. So if the parents hadn't done anything, it totally would have been swept aside. Well, yeah. When Roberta Moore called 911, she had said that her boys had committed suicide, basically. She said they'd shot themselves. The coroner agreed with the Moores then, and the investigation was performed with Roberta's scenario in mind, just kind of taking for granted that she knew what had happened. Yeah, I mean, that one statement. Yeah. My, my boys committed suicide, and that was taken as fact. Yes. From seems that like point it. on. Seems like it. And unfortunately, it just seems like it was the easier thing to do. Well, sure it was. But not everyone. I mean, some officials did try. Especially, I would mention Deputy Roberts. He's a big part of the story. A local reporter interviewed two of the Moore's neighbors on the evening after the bodies had been found. And one woman asked the sheriff if they should be worried about a killer in the area. This is one day after they were found. And the sheriff told her there's no need to worry. It wasn't a homicide. A man who lived near the trail told this reporter that he had heard what sounded like a gunshot in the night or in the very early morning hours. But detectives never even interviewed him. Yeah, and the day after the deaths, the sheriff told the media that the brothers' deaths were not believed to be homicide. He declined to comment on Roberta's statement that they had killed themselves because they didn't like school. Yeah, they weren't really buying that motive. Who would? It's ridiculous. A reporter from the Milwaukee Journal called the Moore House, and he said that a woman told him that Robert had weighed 170 pounds and he'd been teased at school about his weight. This was not true. She also said that the family had called the boys fatties, and that they hated that Robert only liked sweets and wouldn't eat the fresh vegetables that they had from their garden. They might have been a little bit on the chubby side, but they hadn't been teased at school. Schoolmates, teachers would be interviewed, and we'll go over that. But he certainly didn't weigh 170 pounds. He weighed about 130 pounds. Big difference. Yeah, that's what I thought we said in news. 5'3", 130. Yep, that's what the autopsy said. Yeah, so that's not anything we're going to listen to. Exactly. Robert and Ben died on Monday, and by Thursday, the Price County coroner officially declared their deaths suicides. But besides the coroner, the parents, and the sheriff, no one else believed that Ben and Robert Moore had killed themselves. Yeah, Deputy Roberts interviewed teachers at the boys' schools, and he was told that both boys did very well in school, had some friends, and they were not teased. The school superintendent said that Teachers were baffled by Roberta Moore's claim that the boys disliked school. It just made absolutely no sense. Both boys smiled and laughed a lot at school. Now, they weren't allowed to go on field trips or pledge allegiance to the flag or participate in any holiday activities because of the Jehovah's Witness teachings. But the parents never called the school when one of them was late or absent, and they never responded to notes sent home for parent-teacher conferences. The boys were well-behaved, though they were sometimes dirty, and their clothing was outdated or ill-fitting. There's nothing wrong with outdated or ill-fitting clothing if that's all you can afford. Right. 
but it does seem like these parents were negligent with the boys. It could, yeah. When the deputy spoke with younger sister Lisa's teacher, she told him an odd story about a discussion she'd had with Roberta on Lisa's first day of school. So that would have been just a few days before the deaths. Roberta had told the teacher that she and Lisa were not Jehovah's Witnesses. Her husband was, and he forced their sons to go to services with him, she said. And the teacher said that Roberta seemed upset, and she complained that her sons had told her they didn't like to go to the services. She said that they were afraid of their dad. It was just days later that the boys' bodies were found then, so the teacher remembered that conversation. And the deputy also spoke with some of the boys' friends. Every single one of them said that the boys had friends and were well-liked. Neither of the boys had ever said anything to any of their friends about hurting themselves or even about hating school. After these interviews, Roberts knew that John and Roberta Moore had tried to convince everyone that the deaths were a suicide, but he could find nothing to back this up. The Monday their bodies were found was just their fourth day of the school year. Could they hate school that quickly? Several people he'd interviewed told him that this was the first year when the boys could ride the bus to school, and they'd been really excited about that. Yeah, so it's hard to believe they could be less excited after just four days of school. Well, to the point of not wanting to live anymore sounds yeah, right? very difficult to believe. The cause of death for both boys was listed as self-inflicted gunshot wound. Coroner James Dalbizio even said that the two boys had died at the exact same moment, 8.25 a.m., which was the same time that their mother had called the 911 operator. So, boy, that's just laziness. I guess. Sheriff Worsing declined to specify his reasons for dismissing homicide. He had waited two days to be sure the medical examiner agreed with him, and he did. The sheriff's assumption was that the children had either shot themselves on purpose or accidentally. But any rational person might question how two young boys could accidentally shoot themselves in the head at the same time with the same damaged rifle. And even if one brother had witnessed the other brother shooting himself, there didn't seem to be any way he would stick around and make the same horrible mistake. So the sheriff really couldn't come up with a motive for these deaths. Just four days after their deaths, Robert and Ben's bodies were cremated. John Moore had requested the boys be cremated on the same day they died. Normally, when a minor dies, both parents' signatures are required for the disposal of the body. Years later, Roberta claimed she never signed for this. According to her, it was all John's idea. However, if this is true, she certainly never bothered to speak out about her concerns or object. So I entered into this story with a lot of sympathy for Roberta. But it kind of falls apart the deeper we get into the story. It certainly does. So the story that Roberta claimed was true was strange. Indeed, she said that when she met John coming out of the trail after finding his sons dead, he told her he wanted the boys' bodies cremated because it would be cheaper. And according to her, this was before he drove them home to call the sheriff's department. When they were home after she called 911, John pulled a spent shell from his pocket, and Roberta said, where'd you get that? John told her that he had found it under the seat of the riding lawnmower, but she didn't think that any of this information was important enough to share with the police until months had gone by. Right, and remember that he had said he didn't have any shells for it, and yeah. then she saw him pull one out of his pocket, which is very suspicious, and then that's just compounded by her not saying anything. <laughs> Isn't it? Another really odd thing about Roberta and John was that the day after their sons were found dead, they both got up and went to work as they did every other morning. John went to the woods to work, and after helping her father, Roberta joined him. So Roberta was seen shopping in a hardware store with her father that day, and she was laughing and talking as if nothing had even happened. Customers and employees were sickened by this because the community knew about it and they were all in shock over these deaths. Attempting to defend the criticism of her actions, Roberta said that she was in pain, but you know, life had to go on. She had responsibilities, and if her father needed to run an errand, that's just what she did. But the community was really disturbed as they watched the family go about life as if nothing significant had even happened. Memorial services for Robert and Benjamin were scheduled 
for Saturday, September 11th at 2 p.m. It was held at the one place Roberta hated, the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. Roberta said that she objected to her son's service being held at the hall, but John made all the plans and left her out of any decision-making. A high-ranking authority with the Jehovah's Witnesses officiated the service. Much of the time was dedicated to presenting the righteous philosophies of the Witnesses, and to the displeasure of the majority of the audience, they learned more about the religion than they did about personal memories of the boys. Roberta's older sister Mary and her family drove in from Connecticut for the funeral. Afterwards, they went to the Moore home to say goodbye before heading back to Connecticut. Roberta invited the family inside. Mary never wanted to go into the house. She's always nervous around John, and she avoided him as much as possible. So she, they go in, she followed Roberta into the kitchen, and John walked out without speaking to anyone. Now, Mary had disfellowshipped herself from the Jehovah's Witness religion years before, and John had just never forgiven her for this. Even at such a tragic time for Mary and the family, John refused to be civil or friendly. On Tuesday, September 7th, Deputy Roberts had gone to speak with Roberta at her father's home. Cy Paul also lived in the same town, less than four miles from his daughter. His old wooden house looked like it needed to be torn down and rebuilt. Some of the wood was rotten, the paint was peeled off. For the second time, he met with Roberta, the grieving mother, but he saw no outward signs of grief. Sai's mind seemed to be clear, even though he was physically frail. Deputy Roberts sat down with the man, and he was shocked when Sai pulled out a photo of a nearly nude middle-aged woman and showed it to him. He seemed proud and eager to show off the body of his wife, Roberta's mother, who had kept herself fit. For years, she'd been living in a nursing home due to her Alzheimer's disease. Deputy Roberts was embarrassed by this, but he smiled and agreed, yes, she's very attractive. <laughs> she's poor guy. Yeah. Even though Roberts was taken aback by the photo, he was there for a reason. He attempted to change the subject back to these deceased children. Roberta handed the deputy a white piece of paper with a picture drawn on it then and she claimed that Robert had drawn it the year before. The drawing was of a tall building with a safe falling off onto a person on the ground underneath. This looked like a pretty typical comical drawing a kid might do to Roberts, but Roberta was trying to make a connection between the drawing and Robert taking his own life. During the discussion, Cy listened and joined in, but mostly just to support his daughter's statements. It was clear to Roberts that Cy was taking his lead from Roberta and would agree with everything she said. So frustrated and disappointed, the deputy decided to end the interview, feeling just as confused as he ever was. Then on Sunday, September 12th, Roberta showed up at the sheriff's department. She was with her five-year-old daughter, Lisa, and her two older sisters, Linda and Mary. They live in Connecticut. Roberta's sisters were pleasant and nicely dressed, and when speaking, their answers seemed reasonable. Now, this is the total opposite of Roberta. She often seemed confused and unable to clarify even simple statements. The women told the deputy that they had some questions for him and wanted to know how the investigation was going. Now, Roberts brought them up to date about how the school officials and fellow classmates denied the boys had any problems with school, and none of them believed they had killed themselves. Now, the sisters told Roberts that they weren't allowed at the Moore house but they had been in the house after the funeral, and John had treated them like they were invisible. Roberts asked if they felt that John's beliefs might have had something to do with the death of the boys, and this seemed to upset the sisters. They looked at each other, they squirmed, they didn't specifically reply to the question. So their answers were short, sketchy, and they would look at each other before answering. So Roberts decided he'd probably get further if he interviewed them separately. Yes, yeah, so then on the morning of September 15th, he called Mary. She was back at her home. And this time the conversation was much more interesting. She was much more open and talkative. She said, I believe the Jehovah's Witness religion had a lot to do with the death of the boys. The Jehovah's Witness religion teaches fearful things, she said. According to the Witness teachings, anyone disfellowshipped should be stoned or killed. But since the law of the land does not allow that, 
They're just treated like they're dead. The deputy asks, do you think John Moore is capable of killing his own sons? After thinking for a few seconds, Mary replied, I don't think he's capable of doing that, but I do feel nervous when I'm around him. <laughs> How do you take that? Yeah. Say, oh, I, I don't think he could do it, but geez, he sure gives me the creeps. Yeah, so maybe he actually could. Yeah, that's what I take from that. Yes. So the deputy called Roberta's sister, Linda, next. He asked her to expand on anything that might be helpful. And Linda began by saying that John kept Roberta away from the rest of the family because they had fallen from grace with the Jehovah's Witness Church. She then went on to talk about an incident that had happened between her sister and brother-in-law in 1986. Roberta was in the living room, and John was sitting on the couch with a loaded gun pointed at her. The police were called, and Roberta filed for a restraining order against John. She apparently had finally started sticking up for herself. So she temporarily moved to Connecticut, and she moved in with her sister Mary. Now more than once, John ordered her to return to Wisconsin immediately, and when she refused, he threatened to kidnap the children. Now finally, feeling as if she had no other choice, Roberta returned home, even though there was still a restraining order in place. Well, Roberts listened and took notes and rarely interrupted, even though Roberta had never really said anything directly to her, Linda suspected that she was afraid of John. Roberts asked if she felt John may have been involved in the death of the boys. And her response was, I think it is possible that he had something to do with it. She continued, he didn't care much for the boys, but they were good workers in the woods and he had them using chainsaws by age nine. He also refused to buy a memorial stone for the boys. Linda then told Deputy Roberts that John had been upset when he found out the three women had gone to the sheriff's office earlier that week. He had said to Roberta, Next thing you know, they're going to accuse me. Huh. How about that? Linda was questioned about what Roberta had told her regarding the events of the morning when the boys were found. She said Roberta told her that she had walked down the trail and met John coming out, and she never mentioned driving in. Now, her sister also told her that John had said when he found the boys, Robert seemed very peaceful, but Ben was still twitching. She added that by Jehovah's Witness teaching, if one dies before Armageddon, they would be resurrected and saved. So there's a lot to this. We might want to take this apart a little bit. Because if he's saying Robert seemed peaceful, but Ben was still twitching, we're seeing a time frame here that's different. Plus, how could he have possibly been there and Ben was still twitching? That had never been mentioned to the police at all. No. And then if you think about the Jehovah's Witness teaching, you could think, well, maybe John decided to kill them so they could be resurrected and saved. And if they just left the church and continued living, they wouldn't be. Which is crazy, but some zealots have these thoughts, correct? Yeah, no, it could be. Yeah. So Linda said that John had always been weird, but he was also pretty smart. Roberta has to work in the woods to pay off a truck that was originally John's that he sold to her for $3,000. <laughs> okay. And, yeah. And any money that came into the house through his family, he took. Recently, the boys had started hating their work in the woods because all they could do was slow work with their hands and make less money because the county had warned John that they better not be caught using chainsaws again. So John was unhappy about losing two of his best workers. Linda said that she believed the boys did not respect their mother because of their father's blatant disregard for her feelings. And Linda made it known that she didn't believe the boys would have ever driven the old car that morning at all. Robert and Ben were way too afraid of their father to take the risk of him hearing them start up the car in the morning. Yeah, right? Yeah. So then Roberts decided to pay another visit to the boy's grandfather, Cy Paul. This time he seemed more willing to talk, and he had a theory about what had happened to his grandsons. Now remember, this time he doesn't have Roberta with him. Right. Just him. Yes. He said, I really believe John drove the boys out on the trail and shot them, and then walked through the woods back home. I think it only takes 10 minutes to walk through the woods from where the boys were found and get back to his house. But when Roberts left Paul's house, he realized that much more investigation was needed in this case, no matter what his superiors thought. So two days later, he called Roberta, and he told her he would like to speak to her again. 
and she told him to meet her at her father's home because she didn't feel free to speak in front of John. So Roberts returned to Cy Paul's home, and he explained to Roberta and her father that he just wanted to clarify the facts of what had happened the morning of the deaths. So he asked Roberta the question that had been nagging him. Can you tell me why you and your husband did not drive down the trail if you thought your missing children were in there? Now this question seemed to catch Roberta off guard. Well, now I remember. John told me he didn't want to drive down the trail because he was afraid he would be fined. Incredible. Yeah. Now the (laughs) stunned deputy had to fight to keep a straight face. The trail was completely empty, always, on weekday mornings, especially on rainy days. So if the parents were concerned because their sons in the old car had vanished, well, it stopped them from driving down the trail. There's just no way they would have been fined, even if officers had been patrolling the area. And they rarely did that anyway. So this is a completely bullshit explanation. He never asked why Roberta was not willing to go down the trail when she went alone the first time either and had seen the tire tracks. Yes, she had no answer. But... Then she decided she'd remind him about the cartoon drawing with the falling safe that Robert had supposedly drew. This interview was really going nowhere, and Roberts felt there's really no use in continuing, so he said goodbye again and left. Then on November 17th, Roberts got copies of the photos and videotape of the crime scene, which had been taken by investigators. On December 9th, results from the gunshot residue tests arrived. So gunshot residues, the residual powder that escapes from a gun when it's fired. In most cases, three elements, lead, barium, and antimony, are required to meet the scientific threshold for establishing that a substance is GSR. There was really no point in testing Roberta and John's hands for the residue. It had been at least nine hours between when the boys' bodies had been found and the parents' hands were finally tested. Normally, if a suspected shooter's hands are not tested immediately after a shooting, it's purposeless. After any extended period of time, a positive result would be inadmissible in court due to possible contamination from other sources. A negative residue test doesn't prove that a weapon wasn't fired either. Even in controlled conditions, detectable gunshot residue particles might not be deposited on the hands of the shooter each time the weapon is fired. All residues can be removed by thoroughly washing with soap and water, too. So it was no surprise when Roberta and John's GSR results came back negative. A positive GSR test can mean that someone fired a gun, or was just next to a gun, or had even touched a person who had fired a gun. The number of particles is important. The difference between one particle and 17 particles can be very significant. The higher the number of particles, the more likely a person actually fired a weapon. In most cases, at least three particles must be present before a finding can be used as evidence. So the results of both Robert and Ben's GSR tests were positive, showing elevated levels of barium and antimony, but it's unclear if the third element, lead, was present and the number or level of particles is also unknown. So none of that's really helpful. No, not at all. But several months after Robert and Ben's deaths, the Moore family moved into a home that they had looked at the day before Robert and Ben were found. This house was small with only two bedrooms. When Roberta was asked what the living arrangements would have been, and where the boys would have slept had they lived, she just looked perplexed and answered, I never thought about it at the time. (laughs) I forgot about those two kids. I guess we would have fixed up the porch for them to sleep on, she said. That is a good question. (laughs) Yes, it is. It was a very good question. Roberts called up the crime lab and spoke with an investigator who was on the scene that day. He wanted to find out about any fingerprints that may have been found. Roberts was most interested in any prints that had been lifted from the rifle or the spent cartridges. But, inexplicably... There were none. No fingerprints were found on the steering wheel of the old car they had supposedly driven that morning. There was a total of 17 prints lifted from the car and the scene that day. Not a single one of them matched Robert or Ben. So who the prints belonged to has never been determined, 
and has never been investigated. So there's no way the boys could have driven the car down there to take their own lives. Why would they wipe everything down then? It really makes no sense at all. Well, and I'm still stuck at the point where you said that the car seat, driver's seat, was pushed way back, so they, they couldn't have driven anyway. Yes, that's true. And then another big thing is Robert having his legs like over a foot beneath the car. How does that happen? Got me. This is just one big puzzle. Roberta presented various drawings and scribbles to Deputy Roberts months after the deaths, and she seemed to be under the wrong impression that a suicide note or a valid piece of information had been revealed in these items. Roberta explained the drawings must have been done while at the Kingdom Hall. She could tell this, she said, because they were frightening and not the kind of happy pictures that Ben would have drawn at school. She never explained why Robert and Ben were frightened, though. Roberta told the deputy that she had spoken directly with the coroner and that she had read the autopsy reports. And then she said she felt it was time to close the case. She said she was confident that there'd been no foul play, and she was relieved to find out that the boys had died of self-inflicted gunshot wounds. Holy yeah. shit. So, obviously, Deputy Roberts was wondering how Roberta could be relieved to find out her sons had killed themselves. Yeah, why indeed. But by this time, nothing she could say would have surprised him anymore. He knew he was fighting an uphill battle. The sheriff wanted the case closed as a double suicide, and the coroner agreed. And now... The mother wanted the case closed. So whether he agreed or not, Roberts felt he had no choice but to call it quits. Yeah, I'm not sure what the DA was saying, but he must not have been backing up Roberts either. Couldn't have been. So let's fast forward to May 5th, 1994. The deputy went back to the Moors. He went to their new house to see them. It was much smaller than the house where the boys had lived, and he was there to let them know that they were closing the case. Earlier in the investigation, Roberta had said that John had told her that Ben was still twitching when he first saw him, and this was in direct opposition to what John Moore had originally stated. So Roberts asked, Mr. Moore, there have been rumors that Ben may have shown signs of life when you came upon them. Is this true? And John got all like flustered, but then composed himself and said, no way, but I think there were bubbles coming out of Ben's mouth. This is just so much bullshit. I think that this Deputy Roberts had to be a very patient man. Yeah, no kidding. The deputy asked John then if he could remember any other details from when he saw his sons lying on the ground. He said, I thought there were some small branches, maybe a couple of inches long, over the gun. And the position of the gun seemed funny to me. It looked closer to Ben than to Robert. He said, I don't think it's possible that Ben shot himself last. I don't know what this has to do with anything. Yeah. I think he's just saying things to be saying something, right? Right. That's what I think. Roberts had finished talking to them, and they walked him to the door and closed it behind him, and he just let out a big sigh when he got to his car. The case was officially closed, but it certainly had not been resolved. Then there was a knock at his window that startled him, and Roberta was standing there beside the car, motioning for him to roll down the window. She leaned in and thanked him profusely. She told the officer how she appreciated all the work the sheriff's department had put in on the case. She explained that she was confident that now they could finally get on with their lives. But from what Deputy Roberts had seen, the couple had moved on with their lives a long time ago. Yes, they had. So it seems like she was just kissing up to him way too much. She's so happy now, thinking the investigation's over. It's a very ominous sign. It makes me think she had to, if not be involved, have some knowledge. Yes. Yes. Now, while taking care of her father, Roberta had met a registered nurse named Pat, who was also employed by the county as a home care provider, and the two developed an instant friendship. Pat felt sorry for Roberta, who had suffered an unimaginable loss, and they often talked about the case. Roberta now said that she didn't think her sons had killed themselves. They must have been murdered. So if the investigation had been messed up by the sheriff's department, something had to be done. Two young boys were dead without an explanation. 
and the woman discussed writing a book about the case, and Roberta thought this was an excellent idea. So we'll do that. Pat's going to be the author. So on August 11th of 1994, Roberta went to the Price County Sheriff's Department, and she asked to see Sheriff Wayne Worsing. It was time for the boy's property to be returned to her, she said, and she requested and signed for Ben's old station wagon. But no one ever came to pick up the car. It sat in the same impound yard for the next decade. Years later, Roberta would say that someone switched the cars and disposed of the real one, and she had never signed for them to dispose of it. (laughs) So now she starts going off on these crazy conspiracy theories. Yeah, and Pat was starting to have doubts about what Roberta was telling her. She couldn't figure out if Roberta was looking for answers or if she was just trying to hurt the Jehovah's Witnesses. One day, when Pat was alone with Cy Paul, she questioned him about the deaths of his grandsons, and she asked if he remembered anything different about that day, and he said he did. His daughter had come over that morning and sat down at the kitchen table, and she seemed to be watching the clock on the wall closely and nervously, until the call came in from John. Well, oh my God, right? Yeah, maybe I should tell you this a year after the fact. I know. That is super important. That makes me think she knew exactly what was going on, and this was all planned out. And according to Cy Paul, she had never acted that way before. (sighs) And after thinking all this stuff over, Pat told Roberta she was sorry, but she wasn't going to be able to write the book. She said that the story was just too stressful. She had spent many sleepless nights thinking about how the boys must have suffered. And when Roberta talked about the details of the crime and how her children's bodies were found, it felt like she could have been chatting about the weather. She had never seen Roberta cry, but Roberta told Pat that she had no intention of staying with John because she had started to suspect he might know more about the boys' deaths than he was saying. Really? Wow, a revelation. So Roberta took her daughter Lisa and left John in December of 1995. She and John hired lawyers and a custody battle for Lisa began. Roberta could never provide any evidence that John abused Lisa, try as she might. Her goal was to make sure that he would never be allowed to take her to the Kingdom Hall meetings. Family and friends just watched as Roberta became more and more obsessed with maintaining full custody of her daughter and some suggested that she needed some psychological counseling. So she agreed, and she made an appointment in early 1996 at the Medford Counseling Center. This center had both male and female counselors, but after going for a few appointments, Roberta began to request one particular male counselor. After several visits where she seemed more interested in him personally than in dealing with her issues, he refused to see her again. A month later, her female counselor attempted to turn the conversation to her feelings about Robert and Ben's deaths. But what she really wanted to talk about was her new lawyer. She'd fired the last one, she said, and she was really excited because she thought her new attorney was sexually attracted to her. Oh, my God. You know who she's starting to remind me of? Who was the lady who was obsessed with wrestling and was killing her children? And she was just obsessed with the wrestlers being attracted to her. Yeah, I remember the case. Can't remember her name. No, but you're right. Yeah, one of our listeners will remember and let us know, I bet. I'm sure. They have better memories than we do. But yeah, that's the same kind of psychosis. Yeah, so the counselor wasn't able to turn the focus back to the boy's deaths and her grief. The counselor concluded that Roberta purposely redirected the discussions away from grief and spent her energy talking about the custody battle. In her final report, the counselor's impressions of Roberta were noted. I see Roberta as being a very troubled woman who remains very vulnerable and impressionable. Since leaving the Jehovah's Witness faith, she has gotten involved in another branch of Christianity that seems to have some cult-like characteristics. Roberta's two sons committed suicide approximately two and a half years ago at age 10 and 13. She believes that this was due to the pressure put on them to believe in the impending end of the world, as presented by the Jehovah's Witness faith. She believes that rather than burn on earth among the wicked at the time of Armageddon, the boys chose to take their own lives to secure themselves a spot in heaven. So as the custody case went on, and neither Roberta nor John would bend, 
Lisa was assigned a guardian ad litem and a social worker visited with her regularly. Finally, a custody agreement and the property division were agreed on. A divorce was granted in late 1996. Sole physical custody was granted to Roberta. John was given liberal visitation schedule and ordered to pay monthly support payments. Each parent was given the right to provide Lisa with the theological education of his or her choice. On John's visitations, he was free to take Lisa to Kingdom Hall. There was nothing her mother could do to stop that, and Roberta was angry about this. So she tried to convince her daughter about the evils of the Jehovah's Witnesses. After that, Lisa started having crying fits when her father came to pick her up. John eventually got tired of this, and he contacted the judge. Roberta was lectured by the judge for causing her daughter anxiety, and she was forced to stop interfering with the beliefs John wished to teach Lisa. If she refused to cooperate, she would be held in contempt of court. So by the late 1990s, Roberta no longer worked full-time. She had carpal tunnel and tendinitis in both arms and wrists, and according to her, she was permanently disabled. So the state of Wisconsin bought her a voice-activated computer, and Roberta began a campaign to tell her son's story to the public. She wrote about the inaccuracies in the case and the incompetent investigation by the Price County Sheriff. She wrote that she did not believe her sons had committed suicide, and she believed they had been murdered. Roberta called talk show hosts and investigative journalists all around the country. She was available for interviews immediately, she told them, but she was turned down or ignored. Her original story had changed. Roberta had told Deputy Roberts that the only time she had seen Ben that morning was when she walked by the bathroom door. It was cracked open and she could see his legs. She had said that she never saw Robert that morning, but now she was remembering that she had seen Robert, and in her new version of events, both boys were standing together. Not only that, but she recalled that Ben was trying to wake up his sister Lisa that morning. Then in 2000, a production company from Canada contacted Roberta. They wanted to feature the boys' story in a new documentary. Andrew Cole and his crew flew to Wisconsin, and they listened to Roberta's story. The title of the film is The Moore Tragedy, Suicide or Murder. In the documentary, Roberta looks into the camera and seems to confirm that the boys did kill themselves by displaying evidence. She pointed to maps, drawings, and artwork. She never mentions a suicide note, and she seems to be uncertain whether Robert and Ben committed suicide or were murdered. But, she said, if they did do it to themselves, she knows why. It's the Jehovah's Witness teachings. She says, I walked into the trail about two telephone lengths in, then I heard a shot. So, obviously, this statement openly implicates her ex-husband since he'd been on the trail for a while by then. Well, or she could even have done it. Yeah. If she heard a shot, things didn't go as they had described initially, because she said she'd been at her father's house. Yeah. And that they'd found the boys. So nothing makes sense. Nope. A couple of years later, Roberta hired a private investigator, and he confirmed what most people suspected. That butter knife found in the car could not have been used to pry out the stuck shell from the gun's chamber. The P.I. attempted to remove a spent shell from the gun with a set of pliers, and it took him several minutes to accomplish it. There'd been no pliers found at the scene. And the critical question became, who removed the shell, and what did they use since no other viable instrument was found at the scene? And if this could be solved, then Robert and Ben's killer or killers might eventually be identified. Catherine Jewell, who wrote a book about this case titled Brothers Silenced, spoke with C.D. Flowers, who had been a police officer since 1965 with the Houston Police Department. For years, he was a crime scene investigator, and then he had advanced training to work in a mobile crime lab. The experienced investigator said that a possible suicide must be investigated as hard if not harder, than a known homicide. When responding to any DOA call, he said, no matter what the circumstances, it should be treated as a homicide until proven otherwise. A simple liver temperature test could have been performed when the boys were found. 
This is an almost foolproof method of finding out the time of death. The human liver loses one and one-fourth degree of temperature for every hour after death. But this was never done. One of the first things C.D. Flowers said was that, in his professional opinion, the oldest boy, Robert, had been dead several hours longer than Ben. This theory had never been brought up before, but it was noted on the day they were found that Robert was pale and in rigor mortis when the boys were found, while Ben was still warm and pink. And then there were the parents' comments about Ben still being alive. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that part does. And forgetting whether they said that they saw bubbles coming from Ben's mouth or whatever, just that one was pale and in rigor and the other was still warm and pink. There's a lot of hours between those two. So if both parents knew about this, John could have taken Robert out in the middle of the night and done that and left him there. Yeah. And then taken Ben out hours later. Yes. And why were they so dirty? Did they try and run away from their dad? It's really a horrible thought. Yeah, I know. How far from the house was the site? Less than two miles. So he probably did drive him. He wouldn't have walked him down there, would he? I doubt it. I think that's why the car was there. But remember, she said they were in the car. First. Yes. Yeah. So did she think that because there had been some kind of plan to do that? I don't know. Well, none of us know, but there's certainly a lot of questions. When they were found, Robert had already lost all the color in his face, neck, and arms, and the blood had drained to the lowest part of his body. Lividity, the effect of gravity on the blood, had set in. So Flowers stated that there's no doubt about his first impression of the scene. The coroner's assessment of the time of death was incorrect, which we obviously knew because he said they both died at the same time while the mom was already on the phone. Plus, the boys couldn't have died at or near the same time. Ben's body had not even started to change color, and the way the rifle was laying was inconsistent with a gunshot wound to the head and temple area. It would be nearly impossible for the gun to fall in front of Ben's body across his legs. It would have fallen to the side of his head and likely further away. So C.D. Flowers was also stunned at the lack of paperwork, photos, and information found in the case file. This case was mishandled from the first critical minutes, and the mistakes made couldn't be reversed at this point. After looking at the case file, he said that there are more questions than answers, and Flowers determined that, in his expert opinion, Robert and Ben Moore had been murdered. The sheriff's department eventually contacted Roberta to ask if she wanted the boy's old car. It was still sitting in the impound lot. They were going to get rid of it if she didn't. So she wanted nothing to do with it, and she said it should be destroyed. And later that week, a wrecker hauled Ben's old car to the junkyard, where it was crushed. Yes, but remember, then she would say that she didn't give permission for that. Right, they they did that on their own. And that the cars had been switched, remember? Yeah. So that was really kind of crazy. But she was still really anxious for her story to be made public for whatever reason. She sent a letter to the TV show America's Most Wanted, and she said... My two children were killed in 1993. The case was reopened and then closed again as double suicide. I was told they were cremated at Rhinelander Crematorium. We checked there and there are no records, but the man in charge of Rhinelander Crematorium said they may have gone to Hurley Crematorium where those two men were killed. And this was something in the history with complaints of missing bodies and all kinds of crazy stuff. So she went on, my children were two boys, age 10 and 13, and their bodies were found on a recreational trail in Ogma, Wisconsin. I feel sure there could be a link to the killer or killers as someone saw two men with baseball hats on the scene of my children's deaths. Another thing that had never been brought up. Yeah. My prayer is that you find who killed those men and my children. I feel like she was kind of losing it at this point. Yeah, I almost think she's clutching at straws here. Yes. So Roberta then decided to contact a private pathologist and have him review the autopsy photographs and videos. So she wrote to Dr. Ed Friedlander, who is the chairman of the Department of Pathology at Kansas City University of Medicine and Bioscience. In the 1990s, he was an associate medical examiner for Kansas City, Missouri. 
Certainly he was a qualified and respected expert in his field, and he's been an expert witness in many trials. He would be the perfect person to examine the Moore case and give an honest, educated evaluation. So Roberta sent him the steering wheel from Ben's car, the boy's personal effects, the autopsy reports and videos, and all reports to Friedlander so he could get started. Case intrigued and puzzled him. And no matter how much Roberta distracted or tried to hurry his evaluation, he took his time. His initial review left him very concerned that this was a missed homicide. He studied the case for months, even conferring with other pathologists. He determined that he would be willing to testify to the fact that physical evidence in this case does not support the finding of suicide. His final assessment was that he does not believe Robert and Ben killed themselves. So over the years, attempts were made to have the case reopened, but the local authorities as well as the state justice department declined to do so. Roberta seemed to get more paranoid and attention-seeking as she focused her wrath onto the Jehovah's Witness Church. She's refused to undergo hypnosis, even though members of law enforcement and mental health professionals have suggested it as a way to help her remember better what had happened that day. But there's no way she would ever undergo this process. She claimed, it's so easy to put thoughts into someone's mind You call it suggestive reasoning. You tell someone something, and that is what they remember. I looked on the web and found out that sometimes they put information in your head to cover things up. Yikes. Mm -hmm. One thing about Roberta was noted by everyone who spoke to her about her son's case, and that was her lack of emotion. But outward appearances can often be deceiving. Dealing with the death of a loved one affects everyone differently, and there's no correct way to cope. The grieving process after suddenly and violently losing two children at the same time is inconceivable. Still, her responses were not typical, and at times they were disturbingly cold. Her answers to crucial questions were vague at the least, and at most nonsensical, even misleading. John Moore continued to have a close, loving relationship with his only daughter. He remained a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they both attended meetings regularly at the Kingdom Hall. Roberta took back her maiden name, Paul. Lisa graduated from high school in 2006. Price County Sheriff's Department has no plans to reopen the case. So crazy. What do you think? Well, there's no way this is a suicide. And if it's a murder, it's probably the father. I agree, but I certainly think something's up with Roberta as well. Yeah, probably. I mean, she's got some other issues. But it's a really amazing case. So many theories I have on it. I'm just hoping that some of you listening will send me your theories because I'd love to discuss it more. But we've been talking a long time, so I think we'll skip feedback this week and save it for next week, and we'll wrap things up. Okay. Just remember, TCB's music is written and produced by Tristan Capel. You can send comments, a case suggestion, or beer recommendations in an email to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. You can also go to our website to leave your comments, or better yet, leave us a voicemail. Your voicemail may be played on an upcoming episode, and we really would love to hear from you. I'll put a direct link in our show notes for you to click on, and you can record your voicemail. If you are interested in getting your future TCB episodes commercial free, getting an extra members-only episode each month, and getting a gift, you might want to consider subscribing as a tie grabber at tiegrabber.com. It's a really good deal and it gives you a lot more to listen to. So thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time at the quiet end. Saving the seats for you. Come on, guys. Bye-bye. Bye.